I think that I'm sure that you'll agree with me that it's been uh, a fascinating series of panels over the last day and a half. Um, I think what we've learned from the panels, first of all, is that there's a lot going on already. There's a lot going on in the United Kingdom. We heard yesterday that we've got the most ambitious uh, programme of reform anywhere in the world. But there's a lot going on in other parts of the world as well. Uh, there's a huge amount of variation within jurisdictions and between jurisdictions, and systems are developing. And one of the things that has struck me, and that I hope that we might be able to um, pick up in discussion this afternoon and that needs thinking about in the future, is the way that systems need to develop um, in order to meet the demands and challenges of different legal contexts, different jurisdictions, but also just different case types. That where the problem of talking about civil or families is that you're dealing with such a wide, uh, widely varying range of issues, uh, and the systems that might be appropriate for one are not going to be appropriate for another. So we have to think about um, different contexts, different procedures. And when we ask the question about are courts essential or are they irrelevant, I mean, it's not really an either or question, but if we ask are they essential or are they irrelevant, the question may be in what context are you speaking? Um, uh, and to some extent it depends on the issue. I don't think they're ever irrelevant, but they may be less relevant in some contexts than in others. Um, I was also, this is just, I'm just throwing out a random statistic here, which is a bad thing to do. But one of the other things I want to think about is, I can't see Shannon here, uh, but she mentioned that in the Civil Resolution Tribunal in British, Com British Columbia, 80% of their cases are actually being decided or being determined or resolved or ended on the basis of artificial intelligence, um, which is actually an interesting thought. Um, I, I think that um, there's no overarching plan for what's going on. There's a sort of overarching plan in the UK, but even so, things are happening in a slightly haphazard way. Um, and developments in one area are running far ahead of developments in another area. And because of all of this, I think this conference has been tremendously timely. A lot of people said this to me at the beginning. I think this conference is timely. And the purpose of this panel is to draw together some of the issues that have emerged in terms of the developing research agenda, some of the developing research questions. So what is it that we need to know about these systems that are developing? One of the things that um, nobody's spoken about yet is the absence of baseline data. If we, want, if we keep talking about, we want to know how it's working, do we even know how it's working now in a lot of areas? And so that, I don't want to lose sight of the fact that we need to think about um, ba collecting baseline data now before these changes are finalised. We need baseline data in order to do evaluations, sort of before and after evaluations, but we need to be in a position to uh, continually evaluate what's going on. Uh, we need to be able to do experiments. We've heard some very, very fascinating examples of experiments that have gone on elsewhere. We need to be in a position to do that. Um, so we need baseline data, we need longitudinal data, we need experiments, we need qualitative data, we need all sorts of things so that we can understand the changes that are taking place now and in a position to evaluate the changes that will be taking place in the future. For that I think we need a, a partnership between the court service, uh, between the judiciary and the academy. Uh, and we need, we, this is only going to happen if we manage to work together. And the question that um, this panel, I hope, will be thinking about is, first of all, do we have the data that we're going to need? Are we in a position to collect the data that we're going to need? Will we be able to get access to the data that we need in order to uh, conduct those evaluations? But also, do we have the skills, do we have the capacity in the UK to do the kind of work that's going to be necessary to produce robust evaluations of the changes that are taking place. And the question of capacity uh, to undertake empirical research on the justice system is an issue that's been close to the heart of the Nuffield Foundation uh, for at least the last decade and is part of the reason, that, uh, part of the motivation for this conference now was thinking about this huge developing research agenda and worrying again about our capacity to undertake um, robust empirical research. 
Um, so the uh, people that are on the panel this afternoon are all going to address different aspects of the questions of uh, to do with what is the research agenda, but also what are the skills, what are the kinds of research that we need to be doing, what are the skills that we need to have in order to carry out that research, and are we in a position to do it, and if not, what do we need to do, what interventions do we need uh, in order to put ourselves in a position to be able to deliver on that research agenda. So I think that's a really important question. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand over to Jim Greiner, who is extremely well qualified um, to uh, answer some of those questions. He leads the Access to Justice Lab. I love the lab terminal terminology uh, at Harvard and has done some fascinating research on um, access to justice questions. Thank you very much to Hazel uh, and to Natalie for the spectacular conference and the invitation. I had a terrific time. Um, what am I going to talk about? Uh, I'm mostly going to talk about the methodological question that Hazel, Hazel identified and the capacity question uh, that I think is front and center in terms of the evaluation that needs to be done for almost any sort of legal aid, legal services, or court-based program to figure out whether it's working. And I'm happy to talk about specific examples of research that my lab is doing to show you what that looks like or what I think we should, it should look like uh, in many contexts. But the specific thing that we'll be talking about today is methodology as randomized control trial, which is basically, in terms of definition, is the kind of thing that you would do if you're trying to figure out whether a new cancer drug works. The biggest and largest and, and the thing that kind of uh, trial that sort of kicked off the idea of randomized studies in medicine was done here in the United Kingdom. In the, in the early 19, uh, I'd say mid to mid 1940s, uh, started planning for it in the late 1930s. And one of the things I'll try to persuade you on is that we in law are roughly where medicine was in about 1935. Um, and uh, that's bad, I think, on our part. I think it's bad on our part. Um, okay, so what do we, what, basic outline of the talk, well, where are we now? Uh, where do we want to be and how do we get there? Okay, very straightforward. But what are you talking about? Uh, well, I'm talking about, eh, did it go? Mm, nope, there. Talk about rigorous empiricism in the law. And what do I mean by rigorous empiricism in the law and in courts? Well, there's lots of different types of empiricism. There's lots of different types of studies. There are qualitative studies, there are quantitative studies. Within quantitative studies, there are those that are it, trying to figure out what's going on to just measure a snapshot of the state of the world. And there are those that try to figure out causation. And with those in terms of try to figure out causation, there are observational studies and randomized studies. And I'm just going to talk about one piece of that because the randomized study part, because my, my hypothesis is going to be with you that resistance within the legal profession and within the judiciary is strongest when it comes to randomized studies. And so if I can persuade you that randomized studies are a good thing, and they should be done, then I think we should be able to persuade you as researchers that, that research and rigorous empiricism as a whole is a good thing because the resistance is strongest with randomized studies, okay? And that happens to be what I know a little bit more about than anything else, okay? So this is what I'm gonna talk about. Maybe I shouldn't point it. What am I, there we go. But only part of the law, we talk about randomized, random, rigorous empiricism in the law, only part of the law, just the part that deals with the bench and the bar, because there are other parts of the law, for instance, academia. And only what part of randomized rigorous empiricism, that's what I just went over. Just randomized studies and example, okay? So where are we now? Um, well, I think we are at a moment, if we want research, in which we have to make a choice about what sort of instru what I call instrumental epistemology we're going to adopt, okay? And that's a mouthful. What does instrumental epistemology mean? I, th I use the term as not in epistemology, not in how we define truth with a capital T, like well, how do we live the good life? No, not that. But what, how do we get from here to there? What counts as evidence for us to say that something works? Okay? That's what I mean by instrumental epistem epistemology. And there are two views, these are stylized, of course, there are two views of this that we can, that we can choose uh, 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 as between, okay? One of them says what I call reifying professional judgment. One of them says that what's true, what counts as truth, is what I see in my day-to-day -day practice over an accumulation of years and years and decades and decades, and what cool people tell me is true, meaning elites, okay? Meaning people who are recognized as, as authorities, okay? An alternative view, which I'm gonna say is gonna include a role for rigorous empirical techniques, 
is going to say that there's going to be some scientific measurement, there's going to be investigation, we're going to use the sorts of, of techniques that are applied in hard sciences, physical sciences, in social sciences, again, especially the randomized control trial, okay? So what is an RCT, randomized control trial? What is an RCT? And if you, if you remember nothing else from my presentation, remember the next three slides, okay? These are the key slides of the whole thing, okay? So what is an RCT? That's just what, that part, the what is easy, but in defining the what, I'm gonna show you, I think, where I understand the resistance to be, to using RCTs, okay? Because in any judicial system, in any legal system, in any practice system, cases are gonna come in and some mechanism is going to decide whether they get this or that, or multiple this is or that. Some mechanism is going to, it might be chance, it might be a formal randomization process, it might be some human judgment that decides this case needs this process and that case needs that process, or a human being, this case needs this type of, of, of legal <laughs> assistance, that case needs that type of legal assistance, okay? Something's going to decide that, all right? And if we reify professional judgment, what that means is that it's only going to be the human being that is going to make that decision, okay? And if we are evidence-based, that means in certain cases, we are going to turn that decision over to a randomizer for a temporary period of time in order to learn something, okay? Why do we have to do that? Why do we have to turn it over to a randomizer in order to learn? Because the essence of learning what works, causal relationships, how do we produce the result that we want to produce? In order to do that, we have to treat light case, cases differently. That's the only way we know whether the thing that we're attempting to manipulate or change is actually producing the result that we want to use. And this is what sticks in the legal professional's craw. This is what really climbs up into our heads and starts to mess with us, okay? Because the essence of many, for, many definitions of the rule of law is treating light cases alike or treating them with sufficient particular types of due process or ethically there's an equality norm that, that we have. And this is gonna be a primary challenge that, that the legal professionals, or at least they always come to me and level at me when I try to talk somebody into an RCT, okay? And so this is where it's coming from right here, is the choice between these two forms of, nope, I thought I might, might be where I was pointing, but it turned out it's not. Turns out there's something I don't, I'm go, oh, okay. Sometimes we're gonna randomize in order to try to learn something versus we're only going to use, ever use professional judgment, okay? So that's where the challenge is going to come from. Okay, so that's what evi the essence of evidence-based thinking is that we'll sometimes use randomization. Well, what happens if we don't use randomization? Okay, I want to talk with you about that. What happens, what's, what's at stake for us in this, in this decision between these two different forms of instrumental epistemology, okay? Well, I think it's easy, at least in terms of programs that we're trying to evaluate, or new ideas, we're trying to figure out whether they work, and we get the wrong answer. It really, really is as simple as that, or maybe we might get the right answer accidentally. Okay? So, uh, you want some example? You want an example? I'll take you an example from law and then some examples from other fields, okay? <coughs> Let's talk about whether assigning lawyers to, uh, to juveniles who are accused of delinquency, in other words, they're accused of crime, these are, at least in the United States, these are usually technically civil proceedings, they're not criminal proceedings whether that reduces the probability of incarceration, reduces the probability that the, that the juvenile will be removed from the home. Okay, that's the question. If you give the kid a lawyer when the kid's accused of a crime, does that mean it's less likely that the kid will be removed from the home and incarcerated? Okay, everybody got the question? Very straightforward, okay? In other words, is this a place where legal aid can make a difference, okay? And so there have been 11 non-randomized studies under, uh, as I can count, Many of them, most of them with regressions, with controls, whatever your favorite word is, okay, whatever your favorite modeling word is, right, uh, you know, propensity score, or whatever sort of thing you want to mention, okay? This, this is a, a, a heavily studied question. Eleven of them uh, out there, and depending on you, how you count, well, let me ask you, just ask to yourself, do you think which group has the higher incarceration grade, grade the lawyer group or the non-lawyer group, okay? Which one do you think has the higher incarceration rate, okay? And if you uh, believe the majority of these studies, depending again on how you count, it's the, rate, it's the one with the lawyers. That's the one that has the higher incarceration rate, okay? I mean, understand, with regressions and controls and all this modeling stuff, okay? So then the question becomes, 
do you believe that giving the lawyer is a terrible <laughs> idea to a juvenile accused of, accused of a crime because it make, it's going to make it more likely for the juvenile to, to go to jail? Okay? Do you believe that? Okay? I don't. If you don't, what could be explaining the fact that the majority of these studies are, are telling you exactly that story with these controls and these regressions? And what do you do to solve it? Now, I think the answer lies in how the lawyer is assigned to these cases. I think if you, you dig into the juvenile delinquency system, what you find out is that usually what happens is the judge looks in the United States, the judge looks at the case and says, huh, I might have to incarcerate this kid. Early on, the judge is taking an early look at the case. Looking at the charges, these are kind of serious, okay? Looking at the, the background of this kid, what this kid's done, what, you know, preliminary look at what the social workers are telling me, I might have to incarcerate this kid. Oops, if I incarcerate this kid without giving the kid a lawyer, there's a constitutional violation. I better give the kid a lawyer. So the incarceration is causing the lawyer not the lawyer in causing the incarceration, okay? How do you find out what's going on? You randomize the lawyer. Everybody got it? Because that will mean that the cases that get the lawyer and the cases that don't get the lawyer will tell you, you you'll, they'll, they'll be equal in all ways except the lawyer, and you'll get the right answer. And there have been two randomized studies <coughs> in this context. One of them showed that there was a, there definitely a big decrease in, in incarceration rates and then removal from the home rates. And the other ones showed no effect whatsoever. And so I can talk with you about that if you want to hear about why, they, why the uh, authors hypothesize that's true. The point, though, is that big picture, this is the only way that we find out the right, the, that whether we got the right answer, okay? Well, is it just us? Are we lawyers the only ones that are stupid about this whole thing? Are we judges the only ones? That, and I think the answer is no, but other fields have learned a lot faster than we have. Other fields have picked up on this and, and woken up and smelled the coffee a lot faster than we ha have here in law, okay? So here are some examples of, of some other fields, okay? Some folks, these are some folks from some other fields. And I'm going to walk through, give you four slides to show you, do you recognize any of these programs, okay? And I'll tell you, and I'll show you what they have in common in just a second, okay? Uh, well, here's, this is medicine until, what, well, actually, let me go over, before I go over these other fields, let me go over something that happened in medicine. Certainly, in medicine, there were, each, in medicine and in all these other fields, there, in, and these are three examples in medicine, there was an, a, a, a pretty solid professional consensus that something worked, and that consensus was overturned by a set of randomized studies. My own personal one, my daughter, my eight-year-old daughter is here in London with me. I spent the weekend with her, had a blast, by the way. Absolutely fantastic. You know, went to platform nine and three quarters and, you know. She's allergic to peanuts, okay? When she popped up with a peanut allergy early, when she was you know, very, very young, we followed the conventional treatment at the time, which was remove all peanuts from her environment. Do not let her near a peanut, okay? Do not let her near any essence of peanut. No peanut butter, nothing. Turns out, randomized study, that was the consensus at the time, randomized study suggesting you may be able to train a youngster's body that a peanut is not poison if you give the youngster peanuts. In other words, this may, now you have to do it in a controlled way. It's not like we should start smearing peanut butter all over her face or anything like that. But this is exactly contrary to what happened and uh, what the prevailing wisdom is in, 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 uh, in medicine at the time, okay? So, does anyone know what scared straight is? Let's take juveniles who have been accused of crimes, we'll give them, put them into prisons and have prisoners yell at them for a while and that'll scare them straight and then they won't, they won't, uh, they won't uh, commit more crimes in the future, okay? okay? That's program number one, come on. Okay, robot babies, also called infant, infant simulators, Give the 12-year-old girl a robot baby, let the 12-year-old girl take the, take the robot home over the weekend, let the, let the baby do inappropriate things in the middle of the night, and the, kid, and the girl will say, no, 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 I, don't, I won't get pregnant. Okay? That's number two. Number three, anybody got a Fitbit? Anybody wearing one? For if you're already overweight, do you think that the Fitbit helps you reduce weight? Okay, number four, Nobel Prize. Microcredit to increase household income. 
and to, excuse me, and to increase household consumption. This was the idea. It was going to increase household consumption, household income. Okay? Everybody got it? How many of these actually work? Okay? Well, turns out there's varying degrees of evidence. Scared straight, nine RCTs, nine studies, pretty much emerging consensus. This causes more crime. This causes more recidivism, okay? Robot babies, one study so far out of Australia. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> one study, randomized so far, does not, uh, does not help already un obese people lose weight. Six studies in six different countries done by J-PAL, very, very strong researchers. No effect on household income and consumption. Okay? So we should do this a lot in the law. No, we don't. Okay? And it didn't have to be this way. In 1930s, in the early 1930s, there was a randomized study taking advantage of natural randomization. It turns out it was of case, judges, uh, cases to judges, okay? In law, and there was one in medicine, one of the first published studies in medicine. Which one became an evidence-based field, okay? How many RCTs in medicine? How many RCTs in law? Answer, too many to count in medicine. And a student and I went and looked for as many as we could find in law where, again, the key point was what we defined was, was there a, de was there a decision that otherwise would have been made by a legal professional, a judge or a lawyer, that was temporarily replaced by randomization? The answer is 50 in the entire history, at least of the United States. They're more broad, but not many more, okay? 50 in all of law, okay? 50 randomized field experiments in all of law, okay? Because this is, this is showing the current state of all of the research, the way that we're all creating partnerships, and <laughs> there were no RCTs on that slide. I think is an accurate reflection of where we are in law, okay, okay, today, all right? Where are we now? We're not anywhere near the oasis, okay? This is bad. Where do we want to be? I suggest that if we want to know what works, if we want to know what's effective, we have to make the choice to redefine our instrumental epistemology and make law into an evidence-based field. Okay, let's transform it. It's easy to say. That's where we want to be. Okay, all right, easy to say. How do we get there? Ugh, that's tough. Okay, supply, let's talk about it in terms at least in terms of supply and demand, but I think what we'll find out is that these are pretty related concepts because if there were certain kinds of demand, it might be easier to supply researchers who could, who could uh, uh, provide us with the sorts of research. Okay, because I'm going to suggest to you right now it's really hard to build a researcher. It's too hard to build a researcher that can do this kind of work. Okay? It's going to be a hypothesis. Okay, so this is the Access to Justice Lab. And what do we do in terms of supply to try to do supply? Oh, is it going to do it? No. Okay, well, we do studies. <clears throat> these, are, these are examples of a few studies that are already out there or in the field that we're doing or that are so close to being in, 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 uh, out there that I have confidence enough to, to put them on the slide to you. So what's an example of one of them? We heard a lot about algorithms and pretrial risk assessment scores. We have one in the field, four or six about to go, depending on what the Iowa legislature does, whether it legislates ri uh, risk assessment scores out of existence. Okay, that's pending on the governor's desk right now. All right, <clears throat> to, and it's simple, real simple. Randomly, sometimes a judge gets a risk assessment score when deciding whether to a, a, a let an arrestee go. Sometimes a judge doesn't get the risk assessment score. Randomly assigned. Do we get more or less racial discrimination? Depending on your definition of racial discrimination. Okay? It's not, is the risk assessment score biased? <sighs> it is. It's not whether the human decision maker is biased. He is. They're both biased. Which one gives us less, okay? Which one gives us less incarceration, fewer crimes, fewer failures to appear? Legal aid lawyers, can they triage well? Meaning, can they pick the cases where they make the most difference? 
Okay, if we think that what they should do is maximize the outcomes for their client base, can they pick those cases well? Actually, I don't think they're trying to do that at all right now. I think they're doing something entirely different. I want to know whether they can beat a randomizer in terms of, in terms of triage. So we randomize whether a human being makes a triage decision or whether a randomizer makes the triage decision. Okay, we randomize these decision-making processes. You can randomize different decision-making processes. If one of them, instead of a randomizer, you could look at the randomizer and say, the randomizer decides whether somebody gets full, an offer full representation versus self-help materials, or a human being decides that. You could say, well, maybe let's give the human being some assistance, right? Some, some risk assessment score or something like that. Or maybe we'll say that the randomizer is basically the stupidest form of machine ever invented, we could have a, a smarter form of machine, right? So one that takes into account background variables, we could randomize that decision-making process versus this one, okay? All right? Legal uh, lawyer versus self-help might be paper. Fourth bullet point is, uh, no, sorry, fifth bullet point is tech. So taking into account who, in, in the sense of the randomization, tell, it tells us uh, information about, well, who can use the tech, right? Who, can, who needs the paper? And whether the paper is any, any, any better than, than just not just sending people and say, figure it out on your own. Okay, that's a randomized study that we, could, that we could figure out, okay? Supply, the problem is who can do this kind of research, at least the way the legal system is currently set up, okay? And I suggest to you, the problem is that in order to do it right now, you need a sort of warrior wizard, okay? Why? Because in order to do this sort of research, you need to have legal training and practice experience. Why? Because if you don't have practice experience, the judges and the lawyers won't pay any attention to you. When I walk in to, do my, to try to do a study into an office, into a conference room, and say, I want to do a randomized study with you, I want to persuade you to do a randomized study, I do not say, I have a PhD in statistics, they don't care about that. I say, I practiced law for six years, three for the United States Department of Justice doing constitutional and agency uh, cases in federal courts, three for a private law firm doing uh, voting rights and redistricting. Has absolutely nothing to do with what I'm talking there to talk with them about. But I practice law for six years. I speak law. I can speak motion. I can speak pretrial risk uh, conference, right? I know what that is. I can talk about that, that case I had, this horrible case where it was you know, $4 billion and I was lawyer number 65 on a 65 lawyer team. <laughs> I'm like, wow, okay. And then you gotta have some quantitative training, you gotta have some research training, and it helps if you had some research experience. And that's the part I scrimped on. I didn't have any research experience when I started doing this work. Okay, but it helps to actually know what you're doing because I made all kinds of mistakes, stupid mistakes. It would have been really nice to have avoided, okay? How long does that take? Okay, ooh, well, depending on where you are, legal training, three or four years, could be after college in the United States. Practice experience, uh, let's just say, how long are we talking about? <laughs> it's too long. It's too hard to build one of these folks, okay? It's too hard, so what can we do? Well, what if we, collapsed a bunch of this stuff together in require restructuring legal education, probably long overdue anyway, because on its own. Legal education, at least in the United States, is a broken model. Okay? All right, fine. Quant quanti uh, 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 qualitative, quantitative experience and when, or uh, research experience, same thing, okay? But what about the demand? Who wants these things? Well, that's easy right now. Nobody wants them at all. And what sorts of objections do we get? Well, it's, it's this idea that the treatment of people according to randomization is unethical. It's, it violates an equality norm, or it's, it, it takes human judgment out of the process temporarily, okay? There are answers to each of these things. I'm happy to talk about them. The equality norm, same problem in medicine. Medicine wants to treat people the same too because it wants to give them the best treatment, give, give each person the best treatment, okay? So what did they come up with? They came up with the idea of equipoise. They don't know 
what the best treatment is, and when they don't know, it's okay to randomize because you haven't quote unquote deprived anybody of anything. Or if you're in a legal services provide, uh, 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 setting, raise your hand if you're in legal services, and if I gave you an extra $3 million per year for the next 10 years, you'd have to send it back and say, no, no, we got enough money. Have you ever heard that? If you're scarce, then randomization is one permiss a lottery is one permissible way to allocate a scarce resource. And I will tell you, I have had a conversation with a lawyer, a United States lawyer. Okay, you want to do a randomized study on my clients? Forget it. You are not doing a randomized study on my clients. I'm not letting you near them with that randomization. Okay? That is illegal, it's unethical, it's immoral. Now, if what you want to talk about is using a lottery to decide who gets what in a situation because I don't have enough to go around, we'll have that conversation, but you're not going to walk into my office and talk about randomization. I said, I tell you what, you're right, let's do the lottery. <laughs> okay? That's what we're dealing with, okay? These are responses to the, the, the problem, but what do we do about it? And I guess the question is, this is again based on my lab, goes back to here goes back to the experience that I've had with my lab. This rock solid conviction that we know, pick your favorite program, the one that you're running right now. Would you be willing to subject it to randomization against some other alternative, potentially a cheaper alternative? Would you be willing to do it? Or are you rock solid sure that you know based on your experience and your judgment as a professional? That's what the docs used to think in the 1930s too. I'm glad we live in a world in which we don't do that. Okay? This is where I think it's coming from. And so what is my lab doing? More importantly, how do we change it? Well, we could, we, Max Planck has been mentioned a couple of different times. He didn't actually say that, by the way. He had a much longer sentence. Okay? Is there a better way to do it? We don't know any better ways to try to change the field in terms of demand except the usual stuff. Examples, advocacy, trade, meaning legal press, attention grabbing results from our studies that we do. And the fact, the thing that I'm most excited about with this Act Such as Justice Lab is right now at any given time we have around 70, law, 70 students, law, design, undergraduate, government, <coughs> statistics, uh, public policy, students working with the lab at any one point. So that if we are forced to use this method of change, we have a solid chance at making the change. Well, that was a pretty robust argument for RCTs. Uh, we can discuss some of the complexities later, but let's go straight on to Natalie, uh, who's going to talk about capacity and the like. Right. So, um, I like that I decided to start writing my talk with my name is Natalie Byram and I'm Director of Research and Learning at the Legal Education Foundation when you've all seen rather a lot of me over the past two days, but someone I really respect told me that that's never a bad way to start a talk, so I thought I'd do that. It is a huge privilege to speak at the, on such an amazing panel at the end of what's been a fascinating conference. So, just to give you a bit of an overview of what I'm going to speak about sort of in this session. So who the Legal Education Foundation are and our interest in this space, our perspective on capacity in research and, and what we understand by the capacity we need to build, our experiences of the challenges we face to date in trying to build this capacity, why this is so urgent, why it all matters and what the top three things we can and should do about it. So. Who are the Legal Education Foundation? So we're an independent charity um, with an endowment of £250 million. We're a young foundation. We were established in 2012, but we have quite a sort of historic purpose, which is to promote the advancement of legal education and the study of law in all its branches. Uh, to deliver this purpose, we award up to £5 million a year. Um, in grants. Our endowment came from the sale of the College of the Law, an organisation that delivered postgraduate professional legal education in England and Wales. The sale, of the, part of this the sale of this part of the charity's activities provided an opportunity for our governors, chaired by um, Guy Berenger, who was here but now has left, <laughs> to ask themselves the question, why? 
why promote legal education and the study of the law and who is it that we should be educating? And in the context of global cuts to public funding for legal advice, low levels of public legal understanding, and a justice system, as we've heard, on the brink of systemic and historically unprecedented reform, the answer the Foundation's governors arrived at and that drives all of our activities is the belief that legal education, broadly defined, is a vital tool in helping people to secure their rights, protection and fair treatment. And accordingly, our vision is for a justice system that enables all individuals, regardless of background, to secure the rights, protections and fair treatment that they're entitled to under law. So, ooh, point at the right thing, not the screen. So, capacity for what? The focus of our research programme is on building the evidence base of what works in helping all individuals to understand and use the law to secure their rights, protections and fair treatment. At present, there's a lack of robust evidence relating to the outcomes individuals secure in relation to their legal problems, the way in which these outcomes compare to their entitlements as prescribed by law, and this is a critical impediment both to the delivery of our vision and our ability to understand whether we've realised this vision when we've spent the money 20 years down the line, maybe less, I think, not 20 years. Um, how will we know if we've achieved what we intended to? And beyond the immediate interests of the Foundation and in the context of this conference, I would argue that the ability to demonstrate that a justice system delivers what Bentham referred to as rectitude of decision, i.e. the correct application of the law to the facts of the case, is vital in justifying any and all justice systems, whether they're online or physical. And it follows that in order to develop justice systems that enable individuals to secure their entitlements under law, we need to have better information about the outcomes individuals secure in relation to their legal problems and how these compare to what's set out in the laws that are enacted by Parliament. We also need urgently better evidence about the factors that determine an individual's ability to secure the outcomes they're entitled to under law. And this requires the collection of data, both on those who use the justice system and the outcomes they do or do not secure through the processes that they go through. If we have this evidence, it will enable us to strengthen systems and processes to make it easier for individuals, to develop and promote effective interventions that support people to secure just outcomes, and to robustly evaluate both systems and interventions that aim to improve the ability of individuals to secure just outcomes. Um, this will help us to maximise their efficacy and to evidence the value for money to anyone who's minded to defund them. So what is the challenge that we, what are the challenges that we've experienced to date? So firstly, as Jim alluded to in his presentation, there's a lack of a quantitative evidence base for what works in assisting individuals to secure the, the outcomes they're entitled to. In particular, and more generally, a lacuna of research that looks at the outcomes people secure in relation to their justiciable problems generally, whether inside or outside the legal system. This is particularly problematic, as Hazel alluded to at the start of this panel, in the context of the current reform programme. There's a lack of baseline data from which to understand and evaluate the impact of the changes that are happening, and this is a real problem. There's an absence of a culture of implying advanced methodological approaches to justice system questions. Uh, this impacts our ability to demonstrate cause and effect between intervention and outcome. We have a fantastic history of producing high quality, qualitative and mixed methods research in this country. What we are missing is the type of research described by Professor Greiner in his presentation and I really think that's what we need. There are other issues that we've discussed at length at the conference about collection of and access to data on the justice system and related administrative data sets. And there's a lack of a coordinated field of academics and researchers with the multidisciplinary skills, knowledge and expertise to conduct robust empirical research into issues particularly around civil and administrative justice. There's also, it has to be said, a lack of a cultural commitment to evidence-led approaches in designing and delivering legal services and legal education. And there's a strong attachment to the status quo. That's the case in America and it's the case over here and I can see from Susie nodding it's probably the case in Australia as well. So again <laughs> why is the immediate why is there an immediate imperative to address these challenges? So a confluence of factors make the need to build a robust evidence base for what works all the more pressing and entirely urgent. So 
in this country, in England and Wales, the withdrawal of public funding for legal advice and representation, the reforms that we focused on here at the conference, Brexit and the legislative uncertainty that this has created. Um, it's likely to result in the creation of new legal processes and we'll need to understand how to help people navigate them. And there is evidence of an increase in the number of people experiencing problems which could be resolved through legal processes. Um, and these unresolved problems, there's evidence to indicate that they may have negative health and well-being consequences. And so this is a real issue. Curing exceptionalism. So why does this lack of focus on outcomes and lack of capacity to research them matter? The focus of and language of outcomes can be perceived as overly clinical funder speak. This is something we come up against. It's rhetoric borrowed from other disciplines. It's got no place in legal settings or legal research. You know, the distinction is particularly stark when we contrast it with the language that we traditionally use to talk about our justice system, so grand phrases like the majesty of the law. However, the challenges of the day that we're facing in this regard mean in this regard at least that legal exceptionalism must end. Outcomes matter. Outcomes matter because when you design a system for allocating legal services to individuals experiencing intimate partner violence so that they can secure non-molestation orders, if you, design that, if you design that system without recourse to robust evidence derived from outcomes data about who you should prioritise, you put vulnerable people and their children at risk. When you design a naturalisation process without recourse to evidence about the impact of your naturalisation process on integration outcomes, you damage community cohesion. When people aren't able to secure repairs to their accommodation or, are able to, or aren't able to compel landlords to address safety concerns <laughs> where they live, they're exposed to the risk of serious harm and even death. And I don't think I need to spell out here what I'm talking about. And fundamentally, when you're unable to demonstrate that everyone, regardless of background or colour, is equal before the law through showing that all individuals are able to access the justice system when necessary and that the justice system delivers decisions that reflect the merits of the case rather than any other factor. You entrench inequality, risk alienating whole segments of the community and undermine trust in the justice system, which has been a key issue we've discussed today. If you don't understand also what outcomes people receive in respect of their legal claims, how can you ever understand how the laws enacted by Parliament are operating in practice and whether they need to be reformed or improved? A key reflection I had from yesterday was how little emphasis is being placed on this aspect of our legal system in the design of the new online processes and I think this is an issue that is concerning and we should all be alive to. So, what are the top three things that I think need to be done? And this Number one will be an absolute massive surprise to anyone who's listened to me. Get the data architecture around the new processes right. So the current reform program offers an unprecedented opportunity to improve our understanding of who uses the justice system, how they move through or drop out of these processes and the outcomes they secure. Um, GDPR provides opportunities for collecting this data lawfully. If the data collection is undertaken properly, collecting data on the demographic characteristics of those who use the system will create the opportunity to design a justice system that is superior to what's gone before and prove the assertion that the rule of law is alive and well. I don't think this should be framed as a researchers versus policy makers or a researchers versus citizens question. If collected, this data will also improve the ability for policymakers to respond in a timely fashion to questions, for example, about racial disparities in the delivery of our public services. If you don't collect this data also, how can you build confidence in a new system? How can you understand the equalities impact of the reforms? There is a growing movement within BMA, BAME communities in the USA to challenge, uh, to mount a challenge around missing data. The argument being that if you're missing from the data, you're missing from the conversation. And I think that's a really key point. Now, a lot has been made yesterday by Susan Ackland Hood and others of the point that asking questions might deter people, particularly vulnerable people, from using the system. This is the essence of the argument that's raised around GDS standards. But is this really the case? If you need to secure maintenance payments for your child from your ex-partner, 
or appeal a decision made in respect of your welfare benefits, are you really going to be deterred from proceeding because you've been required to input a very small amount of very basic data? In the private sector, I completely understand this argument where you're competing to get customers to use your dispute resolution service. Um, it totally makes sense. But the fact is, for the majority of jurisdictions that we're talking about, there is no other system. It's this or nothing. And for this reason, I think it's morally imperative that we understand how it operates. Additionally, this argument that collecting data will put people off using services flies in the face of the experience of those organisations who work on the front line with vulnerable people. Law centres, for example, who work with some of our most disadvantaged members of our communities, um, collect extensive demographic inequalities data to enable them to report to their funders. They were funded by the Equality and Human Rights Commission. And experience in other areas, um, for example, health trusts, show that this data is routinely collected. So why is law the exception? Susan Ackland Hood made some really positive statements on this yesterday in response to Hazel's comment. But I imagine pushing for the collection of this data will not be an easy sell, particularly if doing so is likely to delay the programme. So supposing that after bashing on about this for two days, I've managed to convince you that this is important, as I think it is. Everyone in this room has a role to play in continuing to make the case for why this is important and exploring with HMCTS the design solutions that might be deployed to limit the attritional impact of asking these questions. This is a, this is a design problem, guys. We, we've got people who can deal with this. So, the second thing that I think needs to be done is... Jim, clearly from me. <laughs> we need Jim. But what I'm seriously saying here is we need to invest in strategic initiatives to catalyse new research approaches and build the field. In short, we need an access to Justice Lab in the UK. Uh, not because we think that RCTs are the only type of evidence that we need, but because it's a gap and it's undermining our ability to look at questions of cause and effect and to determine how to use depleted, restricted public resources to best effect to help people. Now, one of the things, the many things that I love about Jim is that he's very clear that he is building a movement with the lab. He doesn't want to be the only person doing this. He doesn't want the lab to be the only place that does it. We need to replicate this approach within the British Academy and mainstream this agenda. I want a lab in every law school in the country. Like that's, that's the aim, that's the ambition here. In the UK, we have some amazing world-leading examples of empirical research into justice, and a number of authors of this research are in the room. So we have Professor Gen, we have Nigel Balmer, who sat there, Lexi Buck, to name just people that I can see. Um, and we also have some really exciting examples of scholars from other disciplines who are doing fantastic work in this space. Peter John, Abby Adams from Oxford, and uh, Professor Nick Gill from Exeter, just to name a few. Dominic Hangart. Now, we need a focus for coordinating, supporting and growing this network, which leads to my third point. We need to grow the field of funders who support this effort. Um, and we need to renew the enthusiasm and commitment of those funders who have historically supported research in this space. On renewing enthusiasm, as we heard last night, the legal research community has been lucky to receive historic support from foundations such as the Nuffield Foundation. Hello, Tim. Um, and we are very pleased to hear that justice research continues to be a priority. However, we as a community of researchers must not be complacent. Brexit and the impact on research funding and changes to the structure of national funding councils mean that we must continually make the case for why this work is important. UKRI recently have published their focus on smart cities. Now, I would argue that if you want a safer, happier city, you need to understand how to improve access to rights and entitlements. There is a concern internationally that projects that aim to harness administrative data to address wicked issues, so the lab at DC, a program, a program that's being led by the Pew Foundation in the US, these programs looking at how cities use administrative data, they don't use court data, and particularly they don't use civil courts data, and this is an angle that's missing. If you want to solve homelessness, for example, you should be interested in research that helps you to understand what's happening in the housing court. That seems obvious to me, but clearly we're not making the case. As a research community, we need to continue to innovate and push forward in the methodologies and approaches that we use to make the case to funding councils that if they're interested in innovative, cutting-edge research that has the potential to improve lives, 
they need to fund justice system research. Oh, sorry. And my second point was, you need to grow the pool of funders that are interested in this space beyond our historic allies. Now, this might seem an odd message from a funder that we need to fundraise, but the scale of the challenge that was outlined in earlier presentations at this conference means that now more than ever, we need to grow the pool of funders who see this as worth investing in. Now, he's going to hate me for doing this, but everything I've learned about this, I've learned from our chief executive, Matthew Smurden, who sat there. He has been extraordinary in building a coalition of funders that are interested in social welfare law. This has seen the Foundation's flagship programme, the Justice First Fellowship, which funds training for lawyers who are unable to get training contracts in social welfare law, grow to 50 fellows this year in a very short period of time. But how do you get more funders interested in this? You end legal exceptionalism and you talk about what the law is for and what it can achieve for people. So, for example, we have recently co-funded a piece of research with the Joseph Roundtree Foundation, who have a long-standing commitment to alleviating poverty and tackling issues around ho housing, but no tradition of talking about law and rights. In, this flagship in their flagship piece of research on destitution, Matthew noticed that there was no examination of the role of access to law and legal services in creating destitution or providing pathways out of it. Matthew raised this with the head of policy and was shortly to publish a co-funded piece of research with JRF that's led by the fantastic Professor Gronya McKeever, who's sat over there, which highlights the way in which the law and administrative decision making fails people who become destitute and how it can be reformed to rectify this. We've also co-funded work with children in need and comic relief, not because they care about the law, because they care about people. And that's the connection that we all need to make. We need to stop talking about the need for more legal research and start talking about the need to solve social problems and illustrating through research the ways in which the justice system can be used to tackle the pressing issues that we're all facing today. Thank you very much. Powerful argument there for capacity building and more funding. Thank you very Thank much you. indeed. Uh, and now for Susie. There we go. Well, it's an enormous privilege to be here. So, Hazel, thanks for inviting me over. And I must say, I feel very humbled to be on a panel like this. So, I hope there's something to add from the other side of the world. And I'm going to focus my thoughts today on capacity building for evidence-based justice innovation. And by capacity, I'm referring to the skills, the structures, the resources and the commitment required not just to undertake research relevant to policy and practice, but to commission and then use that research to inform decision making. And I'm going to draw on some work done in a previous role at the Law and Justice Foundation of New South Wales but also bringing a few more recent insights from my current role at Health Justice Australia. And the foundation undertakes empirical research into legal needs and access to justice, together with evaluative work with legal aid services on what works to address that need. And we commonly use administrative data in those studies. At, H at Health Justice Australia, we're supporting the implementation and evaluation of the types of integrated services and strategies that the legal needs of broader health evidence would suggest may address complex need and to support system change informed by integrated research, practice and policy. And another stream of work I'll draw upon is a project we did at the Foundation for the New South Wales Department of Justice to investigate the quality and utility of New South Wales civil court and tribunal data to inform policy and practice. And I should say my remarks reflect my Australian experience and I, the evidence of the past few days would suggest you're already well down the path to the types of suggestions I'm probably making today. So we've come together over the past two days around innovation and the challenge and the opportunity that innovation is presenting to justice systems, those working within the systems, to researchers and ultimately the citizens who use these systems. And the particular emphasis here has been on digital innovation in courts and tribunal processes. And generally speaking, of course, this is innovation that will affect uh, access to justice services across the community. But I'd also like to acknowledge what's happening, particularly in our context, in service innovation to support clients who are vulnerable to legal need, but who face particular barriers to using legal systems to resolve their problems. And health justice partnerships are one such service innovation where lawyers are being integrated into healthcare teams to support vulnerable clients 
with health problems that may in fact have a, a legal solution. And the intersector partnerships are innovating and challenging on a number of fronts and from a research perspective provide opportunities to explore the impact of legal problems and legal solutions well beyond our usual frame of access to justice. And I just raised this example to keep our eye on learning from innovation wherever it's happening in the sector, not just on digital innovation. So what's the role and challenge for empirical research in this time of innovation and change? I'd suggest a, one of many primary roles, or one role is uh, to, in a changing justice environment is to inform and influence policy, practice and procedure with relevant quality evidence. And this includes the following types of activities. So undertaking the, un the ongoing research into monitoring the problem or that justice services exist to address, so changing legal need and the accessibility of justice to resolve problems. And this is the type of baseline work that includes community-wide legal need surveys that may provide that sort of barometer of change. It also involves learning from innovation as it's implemented, testing how new processes work and the impact they have. It involves assessing what works best, for whom, in what circumstances, at what cost. And this involves, of course, looking across innovation and comparing innovations both to each other and, as was mentioned earlier, to the existing systems and services that they've been designed to be an improvement from. And importantly, translating research into practice, implementing what is learned so the efforts above can transform into improvement. And I'd suggest this has to include learning from failure and ideally reporting failure so others can learn from that as well. And one way to illustrate the link between these activities and informed policy and practice is through an evaluation cycle. And let's just take research into a new online tribunal as, a, as an example. We start at the top by clearly identifying the need or issue that the tribunal is designed to address. And with a clear eye on that issue, we can articulate what we expect the new tribunal to deliver and design around that aim. But of course, there'll be more than one aim and multiple stakeholders, so we need to be considering effectiveness on a range of domains. And then we co-design and use a test the strategies we build them, and the CRT is a great example of that. And then we monitor services as we implement. To test impact or effectiveness, we turn to the sort of methodologies that Jim has been talking about, RCTs and others. And critically, we then need to be informed by that and act on the information arising. So while the diagram was created to illustrate it's a classic program evaluation cycle, it can help identify the steps, the processes, and the potential participants involved in learning from system change, including digital transformation in courts and tribunals. And the cycle also indicates the range of evaluative or research activities that may occur around the implementation of new programs and where empirical research sort of fits into that cycle. But probably most critical is the observation that this cycle of learning and evidence-informed practice obviously does not just involve researchers. So in addition to researchers, other critical players in our innovating justice systems are the government, funding, uh, funders and policy makers who have a key role in defining the expectations of justice innovations, what outcomes are expected, and who fund research and evaluation into these systems and processes, and who ideally actually use the evidence to inform decision making. There are legal services courts and tribunals who implement and deliver services, and with whom system designers and researchers need to work to understand these services and to collect data. And as justice innovates, we rely on other expertise beyond legal research to both build and understand the impact of systems. And that might mean work more, working more closely with system designers and professionals who are developing innovation in justice and have a key role in the piloting and user testing phases of the projects. It means working more closely with those who use justice systems and to co-design and test those systems. And these, of course, are the clients and the, the system users. And it's their experience of justice processes that we, are a key consideration. And it involves working with other disciplines beyond law to get a more well-rounded picture of the impact of systems as we view justice systems from beyond the access to justice lens. Therefore, building capacity for research means building capacity across the system and the capacity of those within the systems to actually work together. And of course, we need effective data systems to collect information about processes and impact. 
And a challenge we have in Australian services and systems, and maybe the same here, is that those who hold the data do not necessarily have the time or the resources, or perhaps the interest, to interrogate them to answer the relevant policy, uh, re uh, research question, policy relevant research questions. And those do have the capacity, can't easily access the data. And of course, it's the data quality issues, which I'll come back to. So whose capacity, uh, so what's the capacity we need to build? So starting with policymakers and funders and service providers who are the key commissioners and consumers of empirical research and those best placed to use the data and evidence to uh, produce to improve services. It's they who are identifying research questions, funding research efforts and enabling implementation. So in that role, we really need to build capacity to differentiate between high and poor quality evidence so that poor quality research is not accepted as evidence at point one in that evaluation cycle. And that means appreciating the types of methodologies required to answer different research questions. So Jim's example about needing to know about impact and using RCTs. And to fund studies and monitoring systems that are capable of answer, answering these questions. We also need to ask research and evaluative questions that are appropriate to the scale of the project and to the capacity of those from whom the information is sought. And I raise this out of frustration of seeing limited funding added at times it would appear as an afterthought to project budgets to evaluate the effectiveness of the project. And the funding is not enough to answer the question of effectiveness with any rigour, resulting in poor quality evaluation that just doesn't greatly further our understanding of the intervention or its impact. The money would be better spent asking a much more modest question at another point of that in that evaluation cycle, which is within the capacity of those who we're asking the information from and can contribute at least in a small way to our overall body of knowledge. Alternatively, we can ask impact questions that may inform a suite of services and really invest in the research experts to work with services and undertake that research. Courts, tribunals and legal assistance services, of course, are also key partners in learning about innovation first and foremost as they're implementing these changes. And where service providers themselves are designing systems, the issues above apply early apply. But in this context, I want to focus on the very important role of service providers in collecting data that informs monitoring and evaluation. And I'll talk briefly about the capacity of researchers and evaluators before returning to those data challenges and the role of service providers within that. So beyond the capacity, building the capacity of legal researchers to undertake empirical research, which Jim and, and Michael may well be coming back to, um, and that's not my expertise. So I'm, I think we also need to build the uh, research capacity to integrate research into uh, the, sorry, their work into the legal assistance or court systems and to support others working there. And that means building, ensuring that legal researchers have the capacity to ask research which is relevant to policy and practice. And that involves working with government and policy makers, courts and tribunals to understand what it is they need to know uh, about the problems they're dealing with or the services they're running. Uh, to engage with courts and, uh, and service providers to develop research designs and data collection strategies that are actually feasible and meaningful in a busy service delivery context and to support uh, service providers in collecting those data. And of course to translate research into policy and that might mean taking very active steps to publish beyond peer reviewed journals and communicate the implications of the research and even work with practitioners to, to implement the evidence. And I, I'm, I imagine that might in, uh, also in turn require universities to acknowledge the value of that translation work and, and to recognise and reward that effort. It certainly means not just funding the research but its translation into practice. So a key issue been, we've been discussing of course is data and I'll just give you a little bit more information about our, our civil court data project. So the analysis was undertaken in all civil courts in New South Wales, from the local to the supreme, as well as all the divisions in the New South Wales Civil and Administrative Tribunal. And, oh, I've gone, gone ahead, yes. And we were attempting to answer the following questions. And overall, the data sets were quite comprehensive, but with serious limitations for the purpose we were attempting to use it for. And as a result, with quite a lot of work, we're able to answer most of the questions to some degree within each of the jurisdictions. And I'll provide a link to the reports at the end of the presentation. But the issues were many and varied, and I'll just highlight a few today. So first, much of the information that we're... Oh, 
uh, were interested in was in text fields and PDF attachments rather than comparable data fields. So while there might have been comprehensive information about each particular case, the information could not be automatically aggregated across cases. So even in, uh, you know, we talked about demographics before, in attempting to answer the question of who's using the court, the only consistent demographic information in, the, in a data field across the system was whether parties were individual or organisation. And with no instructions to court users about how to differentiate between these categories, for example, if they're a sole trader, the accuracy of even that limited information was compromised. Another issue was the clarity and shared understanding of categories of information such as matter type, um, which were broad and opaque. So the most common matter type in the local court by a long way was mercantile law other. And judging by the matters we found sitting in that category, uh, it was clear that court users, including their representatives, did not have a, clear, uh, a clear or shared understanding of the matter groupings or enough interest to, to uh, enter that data accurately. Thus, there are issues at various points of the data system from the definitions of categories provided, the quality and consistency of, data, consistence, consistency of data entered, how data was stored, and the accessibility of the system to retrieve data. And across the uh, jurisdictions and data systems, there's also inconsistencies in, in how things like matters are even understood and recorded. And a key contributor to these issues is, of course, that they're administrative data systems. They're not designed around the types of evaluative questions we might like to ask. And perhaps this is one of the key opportunities you face now as you build new systems, is to design administrative data systems not just about what around what you need to know to progress or resolve the matter, but around the types of questions you'll be asking of the system to assess whether or not it works. But before you can design the data system, you need clarity around the research questions you're asking and that in turn requires integrated thinking between policy, researchers, practitioners. And you need to consider factors that are affecting data quality from data definition right through to data retrieval. And some other key observations from the civil court data analysis relevant today, quality uh, data requires buy-in from courts and tribunals. So make sure the data is easy to enter, easy to extract and actually useful for decision making along the way. And, I, and make the data available to empirical researchers so we can actually ask the more complex empir uh, empirical questions around effectiveness. And if you build data systems into new courts and tribunal processes, as Hazel said earlier, you still need data regarding the existing and traditional systems for if no other reason than to an offer a comparison to the new. The other opportunity is of course to think about how to link data systems, and a few people have talked about this, both to streamline the data collected, but more importantly, to learn how users and their matters move through various administrative and justice processes. So to sum up, sitting between the issues we're trying to address, be it reduce le reducing legal need or efficiently uh, resolving disputes, and the solutions that we try to address these issues is a mix of evidence and assumption. And the aim of learning from innovation and learning what works best should be to decrease the proportion, uh, sorry, to increase the proportion of evidence and decrease our reliance on educated guesses. But, in, but as the cycle of learning is demonstrated, this requires coordination, even partnership, to link the questions we asked to the problems we seek to address or the outcomes we're looking for, to build strategies focused on those outcomes which are tested, uh, and, and monitored using data systems which also are linked to our research questions, which are, of course, the outcomes we're trying to achieve. Research into effectiveness further supports that learning which is then translated into policy and back into practice. So as if everyone's looking to the universities and researchers to build their capacity, I'd suggest that building the capacity to learn from justice innovation rests with all of us. We need to work across policy, funding, research and practice silos recognising that each should be informed by the other. But that said, as researchers, if we expect policymakers to value evidence and fund its collection, we need to demonstrate its value and show that it's relevant, useful and of high quality. And if we want service providers to work with us to collect those data and learn from innovation, we need to make the data collection feasible and worthwhile and so it informs their decision making too. And more broadly, we need to create smart data systems that gather uh, data relevant to questions of efficiency and effectiveness 
and are accessible enough to enable that ongoing learning. And as a final nod to service innovation, particularly for those with complex needs, we most certainly should as practitioners and researchers look beyond the law and the legal sector to better understand where legal assistance and problem solving fits and supports greater uh, social good. And so the take home, I'd say the real value of justice sector innovation lies in our capacity to learn from it and a key role of empirical legal research within this changing justice environment has to be to work with others to this end. Thanks, Susie. I think the data deficiencies that you uh, refer to are extremely familiar, which is why we've been making the point that where we're setting up new digital systems, we have the opportunity to do it right and to be able to answer the questions. We're going to keep on saying the same thing <laughs> over and over again until somebody definitely listens. Um, before we go to the last one, I'm just going to say that we've got two or three people uh, in the audience from HMCTS, and I'm going to give you warning now that towards the end, um, after the presentations, I would be really interested if on any comments that you would like to make on the value of the kind of research that we've been talking about and its use in... Um, to policy development in the development of these new systems. So I'm kind of warning you now, don't leave the room. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to move on to our um, last presenter, Michael Heise, who's going to talk about capacity building. Um, as the last speaker on the last panel, <laughs> on the last day, I uh, rest assured I understand my responsibilities <laughs> um, <gasps> impeccably. Um, I want to begin with, uh, and I'm sure others share a, uh, a final thank you to Hazel Natalie for uh, organizing a tremendous conference, uh, Nuffield Foundation, the Legal Education Foundation, as well as UCL as, as, as the host. It's been, a, it's been a remarkable conference and it's been a pleasure and a privilege to be among everybody here. And I also applaud everyone's, uh, the fact that you're still here. <laughs> the, um, it's been a real treat for me. Uh, I, I've learned an awful lot about what's going on uh, in, in real time in, in, in UK as well as British Columbia and, and, uh, and elsewhere. The, um, yeah, what, what UK is proposing is ma it's potentially massive. I mean, you, you put a billion dollars on the table. Uh, that's, that's real money. That's, that's pounds, real money. A uh, billion pounds. That's, that's, still, that's even more, 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 real. More, real, more real money. <laughs> I haven't checked the exchange rate uh, this morning, but that, that's, that's serious money. The, um, One irony, irony, though, is that given the magnitude of the change, that, that it, it, the train's already left. I mean, th this is going on right now, and, and Susan's presentation yesterday made very clear that they are in process, in progress. Um, it's one thing, as one of the judges noted earlier today, that you know, they don't know what it's going to look like at the end of the day. It's a, it's a Bayesian, if you will, iterative process. I understand that. I actually applaud that. I think that's a strength. Uh, but what I find potentially ironic is they've been initiated a, a potentially significant, massive public change at the tune of over a billion dollars, a billion, billion pounds, over four to six years, and I'm not quite sure if they really understand what the system looks like now. So I'm not quite sure what they think they're reforming if they really don't have existing current baseline data to get a picture of what it is they're already in the process of changing. They're, they're, it's like trying to pin jello on a wall. They, they move a variable, and a thousand other variables move instantaneously in an unprecedented number of different directions, concurrently. Um, during the Q&A last night, in, in uh, uh, Lady Hale's talk, in exchange between Hazel and Susan, I, I for one, heard a, a direct oral commitment on behalf of, of, of the government to, to make a commitment to data access. And I certainly applaud that, and um, I'll, I'll be curious as to what actually evolves at the end of the day. The uh, one worry is that I worry that, that, that government may understand data or data availability in ways that differ from, from my particular perspective, a very narrow law school-based research perspective, and that the notion of an annual report with a little aggregated pie chart, yeah, yeah that's data. Um, 
but I'm not quite sure if that really serves at all the research community's need for actual case or individual level linkable, manipulable data with all the controls that one would need, let alone the random assignments that, that what Jim pulls off elsewhere. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a very complicated set of research questions that can only be addressed with serious data. I and mean, nothing, before we even get to, you know, uh, David Abrams' artificial intelligence or machine learning or Jim's uh, um, random control experiments, I mean, nothing moves without good data, period. And so, <laughs> first things first, you need good data. And uh, as I understood it, this, the, the train is already running down the track here. And uh, I guess Susan mentioned that they were at least open to the possibility of, ad of adding data points. Um, but you need to get those, you need to work with the government now uh, to put yourself in position to be able to assess the efficacy of, of what potentially may transpire. Now, what you, what you don't have to wait for is getting, getting the baseline data. I mean, you have to have that, uh, or else you don't know what you're comparing, what's, what may evolve over time, too. The, um, now, let's assume, I'll just assume arguendo, that Susan was absolutely dead on correct and in good faith, and, and the, the data will become available. Good, high-quality data will become available. That just turns me to my main point, and that is, what's the, and I take, you know, Hazel's uh, uh, re, you know, panel of questions seriously, what, that just that gets us to the research capacity question. And when I, I'm, I'm construing research capacity narrowly from the silo I know well, that's it's empirical legal research. And uh, now I approach with this a, a few assumptions or, or, or observations. I, I approach this as an outsider, admittedly. And I approach this uh, with respect, with humility, and with, with all the caveats that I've, you all have forgotten more than I've learned about the UK legal educational system. But when my, my point is that, um, my first point is that there may be structural or cultural differences separating the American and UK legal educational systems that may implicate your ability, if you will, to produce the capacity to address the potentially existentially large change in data availability as you move into an online system. The data will, will be generated. The question is will it, whether it will be captured in a way that will be amenable to, to research questions. One, uh, one structural difference is that American law school, law school service graduate level students, not undergraduates. And there's a potentially important distinction in, in, that, in that difference. In the UK, uh, law is an undergraduate endeavor. Um, just at a very practical level, Jim mentioned all his, 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 his uh, RAs. Well, it's the difference between a 17-year-old RA or a 28-year-old RA with professional experience. And that, that can matter if you're trying to run a lab and trying to do some serious, high computational data crunching. Um, most, if not many, US law profs receive undergraduate training in disciplines or fields other than law. I mean, law is not an undergraduate option in the main in, in, in American college universities. Obviously, it's different in, in, in the UK. Um, as a consequence, most law faculty made a decision as a 16, 17, or 18 year old to commit themselves to legal studies as an undergraduate and then progress to the professoriate uh, without any other experience or training in any other fields other than law. Um, consequently, I, 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 to guess, that may help explain the path dependency about why it is that UK legal scholarship is exceptionally well known for its theory, its doctrine, and to the extent that it's empirical, it's typically qualitative as opposed to high computational quantitative. The, um, another observation is that most, many, most, U.S. law-based law profs, um, and I detect a, 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 an, an ageist trend as well, in addition to having training in something other than law, in addition to the law degree, they also typically possess PhDs in fields other than law. And I'm looking at my six or so American law school counterparts here, and four of us have PhDs, I mean, just in this room. 
Um, and we're not alone. Um, and the PhDs arrive from an array of social scientific fields. And what that does at a practical level, it builds the bridges instantly to psychology departments, to economic departments, to political science departments, to government departments, to statistics departments, or public policy departments. And that it builds the collaboration, it facilitates and lubricates the collaborative enterprise, which I think is, is, is important, certainly in the American context, but could be critically important in the UK context. The, uh, the place of empirical legal scholarship is, is largely secured in United States law schools, at least at the elite law schools. It's a legacy of the legal realists from Yale Law School from the early 20th century. But there's no more, uh, you know, we're still a small little tribe, I guess, but, <laughs> but at least we have a seat at certainly the major law schools. And we're no longer anomalies. Every, most every law school that takes itself seriously as, as, a, as a research faculty needs to have at least someone on the faculty who can crunch the math, so to speak, or do the statistics. And it's, it's no longer, uh, we're, we're, we have a seat, if you will, at the table. Um, and that makes, that creates the space for our work that may be different from our senior, I'm, I guess I'm, not, I'm no longer junior, uh, but my senior colleagues as I was going through the system, it created, if you will, the, the safe harbor for me to do work that was somewhat unfamiliar to their own. Um, and I don't know whether that same space exists for junior law faculty in the UK. The, uh, and to the extent that that space does not exist, that also goes to larger institutional support. I mean, empirical research, good high quality of stuff, can be a very risky proposition for someone on the tenure track. Because you can end up with null results after years of data gathering. And you know, that, that may not be pretty in a tenure file. But, um, but to the extent that law faculties understand, promote, nurture, support empirical legal work, then, then that'll, that'll, if you will, increase the supply of it or the production of it, certainly by the junior folks. Um, now, I'm guessing that's this one. But in, in many related fields, certainly in the United States, uh, notably political science or government or politics, whatever you want to call it, schools call it different things. Uh, there is a very robust, very long-standing, uh, focused subfield in law and courts scholarship in the United States. Now, they may feel they've lost some turf over time, the law faculty who also have PhDs in political science. I'll let the turf squabbles, you know, that, that's irrelevant. But there's a very long, well-developed, rich tradition in something called law and courts scholarship. And most, most of it's empirical. Now, I, I don't detect the same tradition in political science or politics or government departments in the UK. So I'm not quite sure who is doing the law and courts. I mean, who, who's been assigned that work or who's taken that work? Who had, who's tooled up in a way that's positioned to do the work? Um, <laughs> even if you have, if the, even if they are tooled up and are positioned to do the work, if they're the data, then nothing moves. The, um, now, there are some common assets that American and UK scholars certainly have available to them. Uh, there's a the Society for Empirical Legal Studies that I've been a part of since its inception. Um, a learned scholarly association uh, you know, exploding in numbers that, that is committed to the, the promotion of this very type of work. And it provides, if you will, a community that cuts across law schools, cuts across departments, cuts across oceans, cuts across the globe, if you will. The, uh, the, annual, the annual meeting, it, it, I would say at least 40% of the participants are coming from some, somewhere other than North America. It is astonishing, the internationalization of empirical legal scholarship. And UK needs to be part of it. It is, but it needs to be a bigger piece of the part of it. The, um, uh, the Journal of Empirical Legal Studies has been around, I think, we're, uh, executive editor's right there, I think we're in volume 17. We have, we have a, 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 a dedicated, high quality, high impact journal um, to this very type of work. Um, Jim's Access to Justice Lab. I mean, uh, you know, kudos to Harvard Law School for supporting a lab 
that tests, among other hypotheses, whether lawyers add value. I mean, <laughs> should it come out the other way, Harvard Law School's mission uh, it kind of takes the legs out of what they're doing. Uh, but nonetheless, they, they, they promoted and, 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 and support Jim's work that, does, uh, very, that pursues very interesting questions empirically. Um, now, what, how best to exploit this potential move in the UK to an online platform? The, uh, as Professor Broadhurst and others have, have already hit home, it's, it's, you know, I, I always begin with data. And, and you, can't, you can't proceed after, to, to the secondary or tertiary questions until you have quality data locked down and secured. Um, the allocation of, of institutional roles here, the, the UK legal institutions, the public, the law schools, the faculty, they should nurture, facilitate, support empirical projects. The senior scholars should mentor for relations across departments, within departments. Junior scholars should coordinate with scholars elsewhere to exploit UK data, uh, collaborate with those with the empirical tools if they lack them themselves. The government offices and the officers, they need to engage with the creation of data sets in, this, in collaboration with the scholars who can help inform precisely the nature and structure of the data sets that will facilitate not only academic research, but equally important public questions. Uh, and funding agencies, it's, it's, it's heartening to hear and see in real time, funding agencies committed to the, the investment in the bricks and mortar, the foundations of empirical work. Yeah, and that's, that's rare, actually. Uh, potential concrete suggestions, sort of import-export strategy, export uh, uh, law scholars to the UK and the, uh, to the US for collaboration, or more collaborations, import leading US uh, empirical scholars into the, US, uh, into the UK for sabbaticals, microconferences, scholarly collaborations, um, insular to the UK, move to electronic data, uh, da database, uh, you, uh, this has to be done or it will be an opportunity lost that, that only comes around uh, generationally if at best. Collaborate within the UK, across your departments, across your academic silos. I mean, the silos make no sense. Uh, they, if they ever did, they certainly don't make any sense today. Um, and to, uh, I'll close on two notes, uh, sort of a good news and a bad news. Um, the bad news is prepare yourself for the possibility that the, the data will not arrive. Um, it's, um, it, many legal institutions publicly, you know, they, they have no incentive institutionally to potentially showing their warts, if you will. And you know, they're not really, this is not their business, it's not what they, they're, 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 their goal in life isn't to make it easier for us to show how they are falling short. Uh, but unless you get the degree of trust and collaboration, uh, prepare yourselves for, for struggles, or continued struggles on the data front. Um, the good news, though, is that, I mean, just this very conference, an and, and enterprise just like this, involving people just like everyone here, is actually illustrative of the very type of collaborations that will move the needle, if you will, in terms of uh, uh, enhancing empirical legal scholarship both in UK and, and everywhere else, because I've certainly learned a lot myself, and, and I'm sure I'm not alone. But I will stop there. Thanks Thank you. Thank you. We have had four really terrific presentations, um, some of them reinforcing the points that have been made earlier, making new points. Um, we've got uh, 10, 15 minutes for discussion, so I'd like to open it to the floor. Um, and I'm putting on notice the HMCTS people that I might come to you in a bit. Okay, go ahead, Judith. Um, I've got a couple of just points really rather than questions, although it does tie in with something that Michael's just said about the train having that speed. Any empirical research actually takes some time. Yeah. If you've got to get it funded, it takes a year to get it set up to get it funded. Then you're going to do it for two or three years. And then the great thing that lawyers tell you is that was like it was three years ago, it's not like that anymore. So that's a real problem in this cycle, and it's a particular problem when the cycle is already spinning out of control. And the second thing, uh, which comes, I would say, out of a career of doing empirical legal research, quantum empirical legal research, sometime uh, uh, in the courts and with what data I can extract from them, is that we don't have a legal system 
Uh, we have, it's been extremely hard to do it with the judiciary, but it's also with HICTS. We don't, and with the ministry, we do not have a re research minded culture in across the piece. Um, so people don't, they're not interested in you doing it. They don't believe you when you found it. Um, and they think they know about it already, um, et cetera, et cetera. And actually that's, alongside capacity, that's a really much harder nut to crack. It's about research mindedness. And it might start at the undergraduate level, and I do my bit at the undergraduate level, but actually I can't make the, minister, the Lord Chancellor think in a research minded way. Thank you, Judith. Can I ask, does anyone from HMCTS, MOJ, want to make any comment on that in terms of the, the sense of the interest in um, empirical research in the policy making process? Is this putting you too much on the spot? Um. I can say something. Yeah, do. Um, I, mean, I, I think, um, you know, I, I hope it's been fairly clear from what other people have said that we do support the, the best collection of data and the best dissemination of data via um, the report programme. The ambition there, the plan is there, I'm conscious of what um, Susan announced last night, you know, as a, but, you know, she made, she made a pretty big sort of statement and I was very conscious of the ripple that went around the room and uh, I think some of our civil servants were sort of ignored, you know, it's a big, big thing to say, you know. And, and, um, but, you know, and, and I guess what people are interested in now is kind of what, what that means in practice, you know, what, what states are going to be collected, when are we going to uh, be making it available to people, and uh, you know, how exactly people are going to be able to access it. Um, I think that there's possibly a perception that we're kind of sitting on all this kind of rich data within the, you know, MOJ and the GTS, and we're kind of being structure about showing, L largely that's not true, you know, we, we, we want better data as much as anyone else, and we're, you know, it's very starved of their, for our own cousins in our research, um, uh, um, and, and, you know, we, like, we can you know, completely support what everybody's saying about, you know, there's, there's a big opportunity here, mm. and, um, you know, we do need to make sure that we don't miss the boat in terms of kind of getting these requirements put in as, you know, Kind of minimum viable product and what that is, and you know, certainly data that I feel needs to be kind of part of that because if you miss the boat on some of this stuff, it's very change of control process can be very difficult. Um, so, um, you know, I think the certainly we, we, we are very supportive, but the will is there, the sound a bit rhetorically, I know, but you know, I, 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 what we need to do is kind of get into these conversations and kind of get external people involved make sure we understand what, what the data is going to be and what we're going to do now. I've well, got following on from, you know, Susan made that big statement, we need to move forward from that. Well, thank you. And can I say that we stand willing yeah. to enter into those conversations. I mean, we've been trying to have the conversations all the time. Yeah. And um, yeah. we, that we, agree, you know, yeah. Michael was saying before, you know, the train's already, it's leaving the station if it hasn't yet gone. And we are fully conscious that unless you get the data collection right at the early stages, fixing it later on is going to be a nightmare. Just, just, Who's this? just to add yeah, to the table, and I mean, I think Chris and I can't speak for HMCTS, because we're not, not uh, HMCTS, but having worked in, uh, as many of you know, a kind of academic environment before moving over to the civil service about five years ago, um, I think there is a great appetite and interest among ministers and the Secretary of State and civil servants um, in the research and data that's out there. Um, so uh, I don't think there's any kind of deliberate holding back of access to admin data, for example. I think there's just kind of a lot of hurdles to be overtaken before access can be ensured. And, and just also another thing to say, maybe especially for people not from England and Wales, I think this country is quite unique in that um, in government you've got government social researchers, government statisticians, government operational researchers, government data scientists who will, for example, um, 
checks with the commissions and my policy colleagues know to make sure that the evidence that this, this, this kind of these submissions is the right evidence that it's of a sufficient quality. So I think that there are kind of positive things happening and um, uh, I think we could do a lot more and we will be doing a lot more in terms of engaging external, external academics, working in partnership, working in partnership with funders. Um, we are hopefully very close to publishing an areas of research interest document which kind of highlights the kind of strategic on the research um, needs we have. Oh, well, that's that's so very encouraging. It's good to hear, Alexi. Um, well, I should say it has been ready for a while. <laughs> Publication yeah. takes... Um, okay. Uh, I've got Karen, Tan, and then I'll come to you, Karen. Yeah, Karen. Hi, uh, so yeah, I'm Karen. I'm from HMCTS, and I might be the only one left in. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I just want to and just kind of reiterate what Alexi and Chris were saying, that you know, we are building a research capacity within the organization, and we have done so far quite a lot of robust user research um, within that kind of research uh, journey that uh, Susie was mentioning before within her presentation. Um, we are looking to develop more quantitative research methodologies and really be implementing them. So Jim was really happy to see your presentation last year. I spent a lot of time presenting on RCTs within HMCPS and the MOJ. I come from a health research background, um, and I did, when I first uh, joined HMCPS, uh, go to meet with some judges and lawyers, and one of the first questions was, you know, where did you study and how long did you practice? And both, I have to say, I haven't and I haven't studied anything in law and I haven't practiced, uh, which did cause a loss in credibility initially. Um, so it's been uh, an interesting journey, but I think what we're really trying to do is build up those partnerships and collaborations because despite the fact that our team is built on a lot of social researchers, data analysts, user researchers, um, we, we know that we can benefit a lot from the academic collaborations and actually we're, after one year of talking about RCTs, we're at the cusp, I don't want to say anything more than that, at the cusp <laughs> of a rapid randomized control trial, which we might be able to run within the organization within the reform. So, uh, this is very insane that we're not sitting on a whole bunch of data. We're trying to think of ways that we can build in those data production mechanisms, and we're trying to work together with academics to reform with different evaluations of our programs to think about, well, what is the routine data that we should be collecting that doesn't really exist, and how do we move forward with this? And it's something I talked to Natalie a lot about as well, of what do researchers need, and these are conversations that we want to keep open. Good, that's very good. Linda, did you want to say something? Yes, please. I just awesome. wanted to say something from the perspective of a trainer, really. Um, I'm a professor at the LSE, and I run the PhD Academy. I set it up, actually, three years ago. And I also run the ESRC's Doctoral Training Partnership. Um, I'm just about to move to Oxford to be the director of the Centre for Social Legal Studies, where I think I got the job on the back of a rant that was almost <laughs> as negative as Michael's about the state of empirical training um, in the UK. So I'm um, really thought the panel presentations were fantastic, actually. Um, but in a way, it's, it's no wonder, I think, that we have a capacity problem in the UK. Uh, we don't teach anybody anything about consul calls at undergraduate level. They don't have to do it for masters. They come to do a PhD. And we have to, treat, to train them to be sociologists or psych social psychologists, as well as doing their PhD in a four-year period. So you know, it's quite tough on what they do. They come out there, they've done sociology 101. Um, but they haven't done the advanced stuff that all the economists and social psychologists are doing alongside them. Um, and, and that's in an institution, the LSE, which is one of the best social science institutions in the world. You know, we're not bringing our lawyers out with advanced methodology skills. Um, and it seems to me, I, I mean, I really valued what Natalie was saying about more funding for socio-legal research. I think good socio-legal, well-trained socio-legal researchers probably does have too much trouble getting funding, I'm going to probably get killed for that. I think the problem is the quality of the applications that come forward. So I sit on a couple of ESRC panels, I've sat on the EQ. I'd say I reject about 60% of the proposals because they just don't have the methodology section and they don't really know what method is. So I think as well as funding projects, we've really got to think about getting the infrastructure in place. Well, people. So the ESRC give 24 
yeah, um, socio legal scholarships out a year in the UK. They give them out to 14 different institutions. So the notion of getting a hub of socio legal scholars that are training, as we used to have at the Oxford Centre, as Hazel and I know, is it just can't happen. I mean, I'm trying to do a master class for two days for the last three years to bring those students together and really push them on the method methodology. But two or three days every summer isn't going to do it. Um, and it seems to me we need more studentships, we need more postdocs, and we actually need some training for mid-career socio-legal yeah. scholars. There's a lot of people that call themselves socio-legal in this country. There's no problem about socio-legal representation in all faculties, but they actually want to learn to do important stuff mid-career. And I think that's something we picked up all through the Socio-Legal Studies Association yep. over the years. So, Scholarships, postdocs, and new career training. And we need to, to get the infrastructure in place for that. Okay, I've got a couple of other people. Karen, did you have a point? Yeah, then? I mean, I think that it's, sorry, was it Linda? Yes. I've just about said it all. But I just wanted to say that I thought Michael's diagnosis was absolutely brilliant. Just, you know, hit every, hit every point, really. Um, and to stress that the dynamic here is so it's not just about getting the data, the data. And I also think, you could, I mean, our experience, some of us in this room working with, um, public law agencies that hold a lot of data, it can be good and you can actually influence what they collect. It, it's, it's a dynamic, it's also about skills, and I think it is about the mid-career and discipline hops, and, and I think that you know, that's the point for the Legal Education Foundation, that I know ESRC do some of this, but we need to support them if they want to do that further training with career so they can hop around distance. If they don't do that, I mean, I'm in a department of sociology, it's a social scientist who tend to be a little bit more sort of disciplinary flexible, I think. Um, but if we don't do that, you know, we're pretty stuffed, really. And I, I mean, my view of the law school is that's still quite disciplinary parochial in this country. Mm -hmm. And that, that goes on, it's, it's right the way through. Right the way through, yeah. Yeah. right. Uh, at the back, sorry. Um, so, Abby. Yeah, um, I'm um, an economist at Oxford, so we should, we should talk. Um, <laughs> because, and, um, what I wanted to say was, it was actually to go back to one of Jane's slides where you had the wizard, and it's like, how does, how does all of these skills exist in one person? It Turns out they don't need yeah. to. And um, I would not let like the fact that perhaps, you know, as the, the fact that lawyers aren't trained in quantitative methods now, hold back the ambition of research agendas. It turns out that if you look down faculty lists in economics departments, Get in touch with the empirical micro people, get in touch with the development economists. We actually have the skills and we, you know, to kind of facilitate and help you kind of make the questions that well, kind of that you're asking, like we'll kind of help you to make them a reality in terms of what methods you need to use and what you actually need to think about when you run an RCT. Um, because um, this has been a part of empirical micro for a long time now. Um, and you know you shouldn't need to reinvent the wheel and start at stage one. You yeah. should just kind of try and team up with us to kind of go in at like the cutting edge of empirical research where it is right now and think about how you apply that to these kind of questions. Abby's so, Abby's too modest to say, but her and um, Jeremiah Prassel, who an academic at Oxford, did the research that basically won the unison case, they demonstrated that the government um, tribunal fees were acting as a deterrent to people bringing cases before the tribunal. And so I was really interested to hear from Abby, like as an economist, like what drew you into the justice space? Because I know when Jim and I went to JPAL, we were talking about trying to get more economists interested in doing this stuff in justice system and it was actually really hard. So what was it for you that, that made you interested in it? Well, so I think there's, there's a kind of a... Um, so Essa Duflo, who's, uh, she's pioneered the use of randomised control trials in economics. She's been trying to, um, her, her, she has a recent essay on the economist as plumber, which is all like, you know, there's other people who say, you know, economists as engineers. And I think there is a growing, um, there's a growing demand for relevance, I think, within the economics academic community. So we have a lot of skills, we do a lot of empirical research, but actually, what gets published in economics journals at the moment is often quite far from being kind of impactful on public policy right now. So there's often like a two or three year time lag between, a res between actually research being done and it coming out in journals. And one thing I've actually really enjoyed of being in and doing a bit more work in this space is you can see the impact of the results come out quite quickly. So um, I think that's one thing to, to, uh, to demonstrate. 
It's also that I don't think economists, well, at least in Oxford, we don't talk to the lawyers. <laughs> um, the American side, the law and economics movement from the 60s, you know, Posner and Calabresi, uh, the economists never left. <laughs> so lawyers have to be careful. <laughs> I think that, I mean, I think the point you made, Abby, is absolutely right. And, you know, if all else fails, collaborate. Don't try and acquire the skills. But actually, this has been a long-term concern and project. And why can't the lawyers actually develop, expand their skills? We don't all, they don't all absolutely have to be doing random control trials. But actually, why couldn't some people begin, some mid-career researchers begin to develop this? Yeah. Why can't we have PhD students who are getting the kind of supervision, the kind of training that will actually expand the range of skills that they have? And I think that's, that's a, a concern for me, is that the, the kind of, OK, collaborate is what, it's, it's a kind of an answer, but I don't think it's enough of an answer. No, yeah, I think it means that things move things can start now if you collaborate and also it's not that you know you learn through the collaboration as well so people I've worked with they now know a whole lot more about empirical research than yeah. they did you know, of, of course I suppose that's the that's the argument for kind of interdisciplinary centres like the Oxford Centre was supposed to be Judith I, I've got a number of others here Judith. Michael's point about some of the history of the US uh, collaboration or generation comes of course from Olin, a large corporate, a corporate uh, funder who funded law and economics, uh, funded seminars, fund, funded all sorts of things in order to generate a certain kind of research to uh, alter the way that judges thought, not in ways that are as social welfareist as the ambiance of this room has engaged. So I just think that as I'm thinking about both funding and research, the same way that Ford helped create clinical education and law and, and uh, society study in the 60s and 70s in the United States. So uh, at least in many countries, the uh, funders on the nonprofits, of course, have again, as I understand, not of the social welfare, but you have to think about who you're inviting in with what research agendas you want to bring as you think about the structures you want to make and what level of regulation or not before um, at least obligations in, in the medicine field in the United States and you're supposed to put which pharmaceutical company paid for the research yeah. is supposed to be part of the, the disclosure statement. So on the ethical issues, you might want to be clear about what agendas are being funded through what research briefs. Did we have, do you have a point? Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Sorry. I'm really interested idea of collaboration, um, but like to expand that beyond arguing research to say you can give us your data or let us help you sign the data marketing. I'm very conscious that HMCTS and uh, in British Columbia, um, the system design has been undertaking a huge amount of research with court users. Um, so HMCTS got 6,000 participants sitting and talking about it. So we're interested to hear much more about from those design of that any methodological innovation um, that the academic community could benefit from. Um, because if you're kind of technically thinking the system is something that's all be thinking methodology as well, I'd like to hear more about that. Um, and also just a note for people in the UK, or I'm sure people in England and Wales, but the Public Accounts Committee has just announced that it's in undertaking an inquiry into modern HMCTS modernization program. Um, and the deadline for that is the 31st of May. Mm. So I think constructively that will be helpful. <laughs> <laughs> I let you want to make a point? Yeah, so uh, I'd like to give another perspective, both as a visual artist and as a not so long ago graduate student myself. Uh, first of all, we are in uh, undergraduate field education, so we have the same model in Israel where we have an LLB, but the law school is very heavily promoting add another second degree and either another uh, BA or uh, a master's degree that you take while you're doing your law school uh, credits. And so you prolong your studies a little bit, perhaps six, six months, uh, and then the two faculties really make an effort to make the schedule work. But then you have, in some of the law schools, about 70% of the class has two degrees at the end of their law school. And so you do have lawyers who have something in common to the that works pretty well. Um, the 
second point is that it is possible to create uh, doctoral programs for in law that have the social science training, the JSP model, the Berkeley, for example, where yeah. they do crunchy in yeah. legal education and the uh, social science training, and they uh, the output is uh, arguably better uh, social science legal scholars, uh, and and that can work. I think that another point is that it goes back to the incentive that law faculty provide mm -hmm. to young uh, faculty members. And that has to do both with uh, publishing collaboration with other specialists so that, that uh, uh, on but also the ability to uh, publish together with uh, PhD uh, students, which is not something that is very customary in some countries. Uh, and so you don't have the incentive to work uh, with undergraduate students on heavily uh, uh, to include them to work on the kind of larger critical work uh, that uh, would require more manpower. And the idea of instituting labs within law schools, not just at large scale 70 uh, student labs such as uh, Jim, but really labs as we do them in social science departments yeah. where you have more students working with you, uh, and that requires, of course, funding. Uh, at least for us, the only way that, that happens is if we get some sort of a large research grant. Or five years or so, and then you can institute something like these law schools had professors that are endowed in the lab the way that happens in other disciplines, then that could help you work. This is the problem, it's the chicken and egg problem. The problem you know, where do you actually break in? Um, I think, oh, Shannon, did you, did you want to? No. Uh, oh, yes, go ahead. Thank you. So um, I'm an epidemiologist with a health background. I'm here because I work with people like Karen, I have a PhD student who's a uh, working in epidemiology with statistics but a law background um, we work on children's social care. But I wanted to make two points about public trust because I haven't heard much said about public trust. And they're two very different points. One is that you need to get your acts together in terms of making sure these data are safe, that they're non-disclosive, and that the results that you're seeing from small cell sizes cannot be married up to the, 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 the legal reports that you might see published. And following on from that, the access is, is done, is, is enabled for bona fide researchers and be very careful about access to commercial companies. But at the same time, you need to widen access so that you can have replicability of results. Because in the complex data, lots of judgments during the analysis, so you need to see them repeated. So that's one thing about public trust and, 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 and the data itself. The second point is public trust, and coming back to June's point about the randomized controlled trial. I'm a medic, so we, we've seen this in medicine, the similar sort of, uh, um, challenge to your personal professional authority of saying, I don't know, therefore randomized. And I think, you know, judges and lawyers will be similarly in that position of if they don't have a clear opinion, then they're undermining their authority and, by extension, the public trust in their authority and the effectiveness of, of their day job. So what we've, what, what's been very useful in health is to have the notion of collective equipoise whereby we use the administrative data, the MOJ and others, and social surveys and so on, to show that decisions and judgments vary. That when you talk to an individual lawyer or judge, of course they will have a very clear opinion about what's right. But collectively, you can show that the distribution of those opinions um, is wide, and then you've got a case for randomized um, and the other sort of effector arm to that is that's what the funding bodies are looking for. Those initial surveys demonstrating collective equipoise give up looking for individual equipoise because it's an essential part of your professional activity as, as you know, to give an opinion. Do you just want to say that? Um, yeah. 
Do you want to go first? I, I was, yeah, I, you go first. No, you go first. No, no. All right. All right. All right, Jim, go first. Yeah, <laughs> polite <Two>, <laughs> I agree 100 percent. Let me just share a couple of reactions when I made precisely these arguments from, from uh, members of the United States Judiciary. One was when I say, Judge A is doing it this way, Judge B is doing it this way, to Judge B, and say, there has to be the, you know, there's equipoise, right? Because y'all are doing completely two different things and that's what I propose to randomize. The response is, well, that's because that's Judge A's cases and my cases are this way. And so I go look and I say, how are the cases assigned to Judge A and Judge B? And they're randomly assigned to Judge A and Judge B. And I point that out and they say, no, 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 Judge A's cases are Judge A's cases. They're different from my cases. In other words, they're always, or, the alternative is, with Judge A in the room, she's wrong. And I just can't convince her that she's wrong. I don't have any equipoise. It's just, and so, the, and so I, what I suggest to you is the, the rock law of solid certainty in law is, I have not found, found a foolproof way. I mean, I think I, I think I am more successful than most people in getting people to do in law random, in randomized control trials. I think I'm more successful than that. I fail, I think, I think I got tenure at Harvard, succeeding one out of 20 times, and now I'm, I've inched that percentage up to about three out of 20 in, in initial conversations. And so my suggestion is that I, I, I don't know yet, because these are exactly the types of arguments that we make. We do the initial data collection, we show that there are different ways of treating the cases, and, and the judges blink the law of large numbers. Right, which is what that really is, right? The, you know, the statistical law of large numbers that when you know you randomly assign A to B, they're all the same after a certain, you know. And so, uh, I, I guess um, if there are other creative pitches that we can make, because these two have about a 15 at most percent success rate. Okay. But one, dis one distinction oh, is that doctors can get sued if they're wrong. Judges can't. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. that's a good point. point. Absolutely. And then, yeah. This is, um, so one thing that I would like to say is that um, I have had loads of conversations with Karen and with others working within HMCTS and I think it's fair to say that actually, like, if you wanted to build a brilliant research team, like, they are the model, Karen's a behavioural scientist, you've got a really multidisciplinary team looking at these things and as for, to Alexi and Chris, like, I haven't had a conversation with an analyst in government that hasn't got the need for this data. And the issue about, and nobody actually thinks that you're currently sat on data that you're not sharing. I don't think anyone in the room feels like that. It's this issue of building in, embedding these data collection systems. And what I know, like I and others at the foundation and in the research community want to do is to try and understand where the blockages are, like be they political or otherwise, to, to making this happen. And, and work in a supportive way, but yeah, I mean, I have, we do, we are lucky in our government. We have really talented researchers and they've always been really generous with their time. So I just wanted to go, like, it's very easy to, I just wanted to make that point clear. Okay, thank you. Christina wants to make a point. Yeah, I, I just wanted to really pick up on, on actually the last three or four speakers um, and the, what was essential here, which is to engage That's very, that's very welcome. I think we're running out of time. It's 20 past six. If we've got a couple of other quick points. David, did you have a quick point? Very quick. Yeah, this is um, to the Oxford uh, women behind me. Um, I'll say, as, as an economist who ended up in the law school, um, it's possible to talk to lawyers and to even 
share a hallway with them. Um, sometimes it's beneficial. Um, and, um, and we would welcome, so, and also as a uh, card carrying member of the Salus Society for Empirical Legal Studies, uh, one of them all in Malia, um, we would love to see more interaction with people on this side of the Atlantic. Um, we actually see it across from people across the channel, but not on this island. And so come to Alia, come to sell, send in your papers, tell your students to, to do so. Like, it's a big gap for some reason that's been missing. There's a lot of people uh, in the US, a lot of economists who do this kind of work and would, would welcome collaboration. Uh, with people over there, there's even a transatlantic conference on crime for those who are interested in that. Good, thank you. Car yes, Karen, so one quick one. We do, we do have an RCT running in the East London Hall, and under the observatory project, I've asked the judge to write about her journey to accepting the RCT. <laughs> it's a short insight paper, and when it's produced, I will send you a copy of it. Thank you. Okay, I think I'm going to call it to a close. Um, I want to first of all thank this panel for fantastic insights. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, I want to thank the audience, not just for staying, <laughs> but actually for making really valuable, insightful contributions throughout yesterday and today. Uh, I said at the beginning, for those of you who weren't here, I said at the beginning that we, were, we had the luxury in this conference, because of the vision of the Legal Education Foundation and the Nuffield Foundation, we had the luxury of choosing all of the panels that we had, choosing each individual speaker has been chosen rather than the kind of conferences where they just emerge. And we chose the people in the audience. And we have actually had some annoyed emails from people saying, why was I not in the audience? But we wanted the people in the audience to have the right combination of people here to have the kind of ex the experience in the audience to make the discussion really valuable. And it has been. And my only observation, which is always the case, is there was never enough time to have all of the conversations that we wanted to have. Now, there is a drink outside for you um, if you uh, want to continue the conversations there. Before doing that, I want to thank um, Tim Garden from the Nuffield Foundation, who I think has disappeared now, uh, but also I'd thank Francis Bright, who is one of the uh, organisers, and Molly Imry from the Nuffield Foundation, to thank... Guy Berenger, Matthew Smurden, the back chief executive of the Legal Education Foundation, and of course Natalie, co-organiser of the conference. Um, and I want to thank, who, who isn't here, Lisa Penfold, yeah. who isn't here, um, and Kat and Rosa on the team at UCL, who've been fantastic. And I want to say again how exceptional I think the presentations have been. I think we've all learned a huge amount, and um, I hope that we will be able to I think this is an ongoing project. I mean, I know Michael said the train's kind of leaving the station, uh, but I think there's an awful lot to do, and I hope that there will be an opportunity in the future to have further conferences on this subject. So anyway, thank you very much, and thank you again to... <laughs>